Welcome to Egypt Live. Uh, we will be publishing an article by Karen Alter, James Gatta, and Larry Helfer entitled Backlash Against International Courts in West, East, and Southern Africa Causes and Consequences. And I have with me today uh, Karen Alter. Uh, any uh, academic lawyer dealing with European Union law will, of course, know the work of Karen Alter. Uh, pioneering work not only on the European Court of Justice but on the judicial system in Europe, relationship between national courts and European court. Uh, insightful and also a lesson to all of us in rigorous political science analysis, indispensable work. And more recently Karen has branched out, so to speak, to other regional organizations and international law generally. And before we get to talk about this particular article. Let's spend some minutes of your experience of a political scientist entering into the world of law. And I should make drop one little footnote. Here is a political scientist who actually knows law. So, but it must have been an interesting experience encountering this world of law and encountering this world of academic lawyers and the whole field of European law, yeah. regional law and international law. So apart from this article, Talk a little bit about that experience. Well, I fumbled around a lot um, <laughs> because I didn't have a formal legal training. And you know, for political scientists, we care about the argument. And so sometimes I would say things in ways that the lawyers would think were just wrong. And they would get very, very frustrated. And I felt like, just tell me how to say it right, because everything you're frustrated about is not my point. And so I'm happy to change and tweak the words so that I say it in a way that doesn't upset you so much. And it took a long time. I actually added a line to my, uh, my CV that I speak legalese. It took a long time to understand enough about the law that I just would not say the wrong word. So I still remember my first publication on the Cassis de Dijon decision. I called the decision a verdict because, you know, what did I know? And it, it should have been a judgment. And no one pointed it out because it was in a political science journal. But those kinds of little mistakes would really get a lawyer very, very upset. And, you know, I would say, just global change judgment, what do I care? But they would then start to think that I didn't know what I was talking about. So I remember when my, I submitted my first book to be published, the one at Oxford. Um, it was, I submitted it to political science, but Oxford had a rule that anything on European law had to be sent to London to the legal list. So I sent it to New York political science, they sent it to Oxford, the legal list, and it was rejected um, because they felt that I didn't, they didn't like how I cited legal decisions. You cite in France, you cite the journal article where it's published. They thought that my analysis was anachronistic because they didn't understand that I was intentionally trying to understand how lawyers thought about the issue in the 1960s. I wasn't trying to understand how they thought about it in the 90s. So they thought I got it wrong because that was not how they thought about it today. And they had all kinds of problems with it. So they rejected it. And I wrote them back and uh, said, I'm not challenging your decision, but I submitted this to a political science list. And you had it reviewed by lawyers, and it's not a piece of law. And so how do I get this reviewed by political scientists? And they immediately realized that they had made a mistake, because it was meant to be an interdisciplinary list. And they said, we'll send it out, to a, we'll send out for review again to political scientists. And literally within two weeks, I then had a contract. But they required that it have a legal read. So my first book has like a law book, a set of decisions you know, in front of it like you would a law book. And I had to hire a lawyer, or I think the, the publishers did, to have them read it and make sure that it was legally sound enough to be published. So it but used be, to be But challenging. beyond that, you know, the sort of correct vocabulary, et cetera, the, uh, we, we're going back about 20 years. Yeah. There might have also been a resistant, what is this political scientists going to teach us about what we do in law and how we should think about these decisions. You must have met a bit of that as well. Oh my goodness. Uh, no, I met a lot of that. Because at the time, now it's taken as kind of conventional wisdom that, that there is a political element to what the European court was doing. But back in the day, and I think of our old friend Hjalti Rasmussen, who really bore the brunt of this, you know, it was heretical to say that there were politics going on. 
So I do remember one of, I was a graduate student and presenting in Brussels and they used to have, USA used to have this great idea of having practitioners comment on scholarship. So it was a member of the commission commenting on my article, Masters of the Treaty, and he just yelled at me, how could, why do you see politics everywhere? Why do you see conflict and everywhere? Why can't it just be that the European court is working out the incredible logic of what, you know, what's in the law? And so there was real hostility among the continental European lawyers to the idea that there was contestation, that you know, what I did in my first book is I said, there, there are a handful of plausible legal interpretations. And so the question is, why do you choose which, what is actually a really rather iconoclastic legal interpretation? How does this interpretation win when alongside there's perfectly reasonable nationally based interpretations that had been dominant for years? That kind of analysis. So this is this has changed now. I it's think changed, your work. Yeah. I think your work is accepted. It's read yeah. widely. Do you regret that a little bit? It's kind of mainstream. Okay, Karen Alta <laughs> doing her thing. We need to read it. But didn't you like a little bit this kind of contestation? Uh, what I miss is people challenging me and telling me I'm full of crap because then you know that sharpens your arguments. Um, I thought that I think the literature has gotten more interesting. And I think the biggest compliment I've ever had in my career was when Dieter Grimm told me that as, as a newly appointed German Constitutional Court judge, he read my book to figure out what was actually going on in Germany. So people who, it kind of un, unveiled what was going on behind for those who couldn't decode what was going on in the debate. Um, so I, I I'm don't glad to say that. that I believe that it's been a generational change, but it's now accepted and people will read so. with interest and there are a lot more people. I remember my, what impressed me most about your first book, that uh, things that I wrote about intuitively, you were writing about rigorously. Mm -hmm. And the thing that impressed me most was on one or two occasions you said, there's no way of giving an answer to this question. <laughs> yeah. and, and I was saying, no, no, there is a way, this is what I think and that's the correct answer. And you came in as a political scientist and said, you may be right, you may be wrong, but there's no way of actually knowing for sure what is yeah. the answer to this. Uh, tell, us, tell me also a little bit before we get to the article, there must have also been some resistance in American, uh, an American woman coming into a European uh, world, which at the time was also very male dominated. You know, I think I, I have a trait of being oblivious to certain things. So I didn't realize when I went to do my field work that by saying I was a political scientist looking at this issue, I could have practically been saying I'm a PE teacher. The assumption was I knew nothing PE of what I was physical talking. Physical education. <laughs> yeah, that you know, it's like I walked in. I want to interview you, but I know nothing of what I'm talking about because I'm a woman. Although I didn't think of that at the time, but because I'm a political scientist. But I had a, a couple of of people who really helped me, and then I knew I was okay. So when when I started this project, I was at Harvard and Federico Mancini was good friends with Stanley Hoffman. And he's a judge on the European Court of Justice. And I said, why did national judges accept the supremacy of European law? And he said, that's a really good question. I'm wondering that myself. So I knew I was okay, even though I then went to Germany and met with all of these very famous German judges who told me I had, or German law professors who told me I had no question and that I simply didn't understand what I was doing. And one of my interviews um, was about the Maastricht decision, the 1993 German Maastricht decision. And I got to the judge who wrote it by writing to the journalist of Der Spiegel. And I thought that in my head, the journalist for Der Spiegel who covers the Constitutional Court would be like Nina Totenberg, who's the NPR correspondent in the United States and is always unveiling what's really going on in the US Supreme Court. So I thought this journalist would be Nina Totenberg. And he sat there and explained to me why the 1993 Maastricht decision was not a reversal of the so long, uh, that it was just, I was misunderstanding the decision entirely. I didn't know what I was talking about. But he was nice enough to set up a meeting with Kirchhoff who'd wrote the decision. And so after the lunch, I go and I talk to Kirchhoff and I say, it seems to me like you're really repudiating the so long too. He says, absolutely. And he spoke to me very frankly. So I, those two people, made me know that I knew what I was talking about, even though there were all of these lawyers who were insisting that there was no question, that I was studying didn't exist, the question. Well, I do think we live today in a slightly different world. We do. Uh, you're sort of the young generation coming up is not going to meet that kind of resistance, and it's also happening a lot in Europe, so mm -hmm. uh, it's, all, it's a little bit uh, 
memory lane. So le let's come to the article backlash against international court in West, uh -huh. East and Southern Africa, cause and consequences, and just frame it a little bit for uh, our readers. One of the reasons we do each alive is to whet people's appetite to go and read an article. Uh -huh. So give them a trailer. So the, the trail of this article, and then I'm going to go back a little bit to what we were talking about, is that we have three African-based courts that are all modeled on the European Court of Justice, the ECOWAS Court in West Africa, the East African Court of Justice in the East African community, and the Southern African Development Community Court. And all three of these courts made decisions that deeply upset a member state. And um, we hear a lot about backlash and concerns about backlash, but usually it's just heated rhetoric and nothing actually ever happens. In all three of these cases, a government went so far as to draft a proposal that they presented to the collective heads of states to discuss that was designed to sanction a court. So these were the only examples that I know that actually got to the point. Well, let me caveat, Britain did that once in, in Europe. But it very rarely gets to the point of an actual um, recommendation to sanction the court. And in the ECOWAS, the proposal failed completely, even though it was the most benign of all three of the proposals. In the East African community, the proposal got redirected, and so there was a revision of the court statute, and it has affected the functioning of the court. Um, and in SADC, the court was disbanded and shut down. So we wanted to both understand these three challenges, but also understand the different outcomes um, of these backlash efforts. The background piece I was going to say is that if, if um, we, didn't, we didn't set out explicitly to be looking at this issue. Of course, this is what we were going to be looking at. But if we had said that we were researching this issue, nobody would have talked to us. So we did, and, and when we were doing the ECOWAS research, we were not researching this issue. We just found out about the backlash along the way. But for the other two courts, we were researching this issue. And we framed all of our interviews as an effort to understand what contributions the different actors thought that regional courts could make. It's a very open-ended, what do you see the purpose of these regional courts? So that we could then back into, well, maybe these courts were not serving the purpose, which is why there was this backlash in the first place. Um, and I think that's very important along the way while we were doing this research. People were writing me saying, I want to research this topic and no one will talk to me. And I was like, yeah, because if they won't talk to you about this topic. You have to find another way to frame it. So uh, grant me, everybody who's watching this, the, that it's interesting to read this story. I mean, in and of itself, mm -hmm. it's interesting. But I want to uh, insist a little bit with you. So tell me the political science part of it. You know, beyond the narrative, he has a story of, right. which is kind of, it could be an interesting uh, article in The Economist or in the Financial right. Times or something. But you come to it as a political scientist, meaning you're going to conceptualize, you're going right. to test some things, there are going to be some explan right. explanations which some work and some don't work. So kind of... Uh, give us the scientific dimension of this right. research rather than the narrative only. I needed to understand what happened to the SADC court because it's kind of the cautionary tale of, of everyone is saying if the international courts go too far, you know, we're, they're going to have this kind of backlash and it never happens. So I needed to understand how, how the backlash against SADC succeeded, what it took to make it succeed. And, where I'm going with this, now that I understand the SADC case in detail, is I'm going to step back and look at backlash more generally. And the way, I, the way I do these kind of topics is I'd like to have a conference that asks the question, is there such thing as a politics of backlash? And I'd like to bring in people who study racial politics, people who study um, immigration politics, all the kinds of issues where we think that you make a misstep, and by making that misstep, you foment a backlash. But if you think about the way that politics works, it's always through contestation. You know, if I have to run for office, it's because you're horrible. And I have to, therefore, say everything you did was terrible. Otherwise, why would you vote for me? So I'm not sure that there actually is this thing called a politics of backlash. But people keep saying for international courts, if you misstep, if you indict this person, you know, though there will be a backlash that will undermine the institution. And I have a hunch, I wouldn't call it a theory, that sometimes, obviously, SADC was the end of the court. Uh, it's being resurrected, but it's going to be completely different. 
But oftentimes when you have a backlash, you really flush out the supporters because no one's really paying attention. Everyone's taking the court for granted. But if you look at like the history of the European Court of Human Rights, sometimes at its darkest moments, people say, hey, wait, we want this court. And it flushes out the defenders. So it looks like an adir is actually the moment of resurgence. So I want to try to understand how these backlash dynamics work. I think it's most important today for the International Criminal Court. So probably where I'm building up to it is to start to think about the International Criminal Court and um, and the politics of backlash more generally. So I needed to understand a case of what we call successful backlash in order to understand the dynamics that can make backlash politics succeed. You know, by reading the article and the focus on the international courts in West, East and Southern Africa, one might get the impression, ah, but here in Europe uh, it's a different culture, etc. But of course, there's a huge backlash also to decisions of the European Court of yeah. Justice, except it takes different forms. So it's not we need to, to pack the court, you know, sort of American 30s, or abolish the court, but it might manifest itself in the choice of judges that member states send to the court. It might take the form in writing a new treaty, trying to shield Right. from the court certain areas of jurisdiction so the European Union lawyers will know that sort of the, the third pillar there was expressly shielding, shielding mm -hmm. it from the European Court yeah. of Justice uh, and the other forms of backlash with, with, with which you are familiar reactions of national courts mm -hmm. uh, do they make a reference do they not make a reference etc so what can we I mean the, how does the politics of backlash I don't, know, don't want even to say the politics of backlash, but the phen phenomenology of backlash work in Europe is distinct. I mean, it's... Well, so that's why I'm trying to think about, I really mean I'm open to this question, is there such thing as a politics of backlash? Because everything you just described to me is ordinary judicial politics. When courts get power and, and when their fundamental mandate is unchangeable, then the politics to influence them gets redirected into the appointments process, into writing new legislation. So it becomes almost impossible to change past legislation in Europe. Although in the Andean context, that's actually what they do. They just change the legislation. Um, it'll get redirected, but I consider that normal judicial politics. So what's the, the fault line between normal judicial politics or normal politics about the judiciary, sort mm -hmm. of inflecting it a bit, and backlash. Well, we def this, this is a more extreme version in this paper, so it was actually fairly easy to define it, which is that a member state actually put forward specific proposals, and the aim of the proposals was to make the decision and or the court and or the judges disappear. And so it's about the clear, so if you think of a backlash along a continuum, this would be the clearly marked continuum of, yes, they're trying to get rid of the court or majorly change the court in response to a ruling that they disliked. It's very transparent and seldom would it be as transparent in Europe, partly because it wouldn't succeed. So when I corrected myself and said in Europe there was this backlash, that was in the time that Britain, Britain um, wanted to create an appellate process and it was in the 90s and it was after the, um, now my memory is going with age, um, they added to the Maastricht, the Barber Protocol. Right, so they, they, instead of reversing the court, which was their original plan, and basically all of their lawyers said, it's never going to work, this proposal. So the proposal never got to the formal stage of actually submitting it to a group of member states to discuss. And instead, they just added the Barber Protocol to the Maastricht Treaty. Um, Would you call backlash, for example, the voices in the United Kingdom, which are minority, but not mm -hmm. cranky, which says Britain should withdraw from the European Court on Human Rights. That's, is that a form of backlash? It's one way of getting rid of the court is let the court stay, right. but we should just not be... That would be an, an exit strategy, which has happened in a number of different courts. And honestly, this is the part that I'm still working out in my ideas. So there's, there's this genesis and why I want to have this conference with people who study race and uh, immigration is to start to think about where you draw the line of backlash. So I can say in these three cases it's pretty clear. But how far back on the continuum do you draw the line? I would think that exit, because you're unhappy um, with the decision, would fall on the side of backlash. Um, I don't think that 
necessarily stacking a court would, but don't hold me to any of this. I will, when I get to that point, um, I'll well, write it and it present from, it. You know, in terms of, in terms of developing social science and maybe also some elements of a political theory, why is it, why are you insisting that the line between backlash and quote, normal mm. judicial politics or politics about the judiciary is so important? Isn't it just on a continuum and sort of inherently interesting to say courts will give decisions that make people in power unhappy beyond just we lost mm -hmm. a case and it's worth studying the various forms of reactions to that kind of power contestation. You're Why right. is backlash such an important fault line? You're right about that. Well, so in political science, we have an extensive literature on contested politics and contested politics could be hundreds of thousands of people in the street. And unless it leads to a revolution, you would just call that contested politics if it stays within the system. And so for me, when I ask this question of, is there a specific politics of backlash? I'm wanting to understand um, when you hit a nerve in a cord that mobilizes people in just a really visceral kind of extreme way, what is that politics? What gives rise to it? Um, and what are then the counter mobilizations? So for political science, it matters if it's contested but, no, politics or backlash. But hold on a minute. Because if the question is when the court hits a nerve that mobilizes, I find that, yes, very, very interesting. But that is independent of the reaction. The reaction can be what you call backlash, which is kind of exit or let's get rid of the court or it can be other forms, but the trigger is important. What is it in judicial decisions that create this kind of, and you kind of, in a way, might be shifting attention to an exceptional situation, since in Europe we would say, well, that kind of backlash that you describe in uh, mm. is so exceptional, this is not gonna, it's not happened here, it's not gonna happen here, even the exit is, mm -hmm. um, Right. the margin, so it's uninteresting for us, and that would be a pity. It's like no. studying revolution. We right. are not in a revolutionary society. We don't need to study revolution. It's not going to happen here. I mean, aren't you in these three risking cases, that you will marginalize the importance of actually what's going on here? I'm, I'm not worried about that. In these three cases, you have thin-skinned leaders who are just not used to in their domestic realm ever losing. So they're just stunned that some international court would tell them something that their domestic courts would never tell them. Um, and I think part of the process of building international court authority is toughening people up a little bit. If, if you live in a system of judicial review, governments lose all the time in front of international courts, or national courts, and the sky doesn't fall. So the, thin, the skin is much, much thicker here. Um, that being said, this idea of how you sanction a court, when I, when I needed to know what happened in SADC, but when I build this up into a paper that I'll probably publish into a political science journal about backlash, it'll have the range of courts, including European courts, and it'll have the International Criminal Court. So I had to deeply understand the most extreme cautionary tale. I think there's a lot of interest in this because people want to understand if SADC is is the cautionary tale or really exceptional? And what we show in this paper is that the way, the way that Sadek was shut down um, is actually much different than I thought. It took Mugabe three and a half years. And basically, he just used stubborn blockages and attrition. And it got to the point he wouldn't let them reappoint any new judges. And um, he wouldn't let them reappoint any new staff. So by the end of his opposition, the court just didn't exist. It didn't have any judges. It didn't have a registrar. And so he was able to use that kind of politics. One of the pieces that I still don't fully understand is he, he took the provision of the treaty that was silent on what happens if a judge term ends. The treaty only says you have to reappoint within three months, but it doesn't say what happens if you don't reappoint within three months. So in ECOWAS, they got way behind on reappointing their judges. Um, it's a very big political decision who gets the next judge, not so much about um, the judge itself, but about 
the high-level offices in ECOWAS. So a, a judgeship, there's 15 countries in ECOWAS and there's only seven judges. And which country's turn it is to get a judge is very political and has to do with you know, the number of commissioners and other high-level leaders. So they got very far behind. Every single judge's term had expired. And they kept every judge on until they could replace the court. And they ended up replacing the entire bank of court at the same time they were so far behind. So there's another area where the treaty is vague, but yet they kept the court working. And in Sadak, they used the vagueness of the treaty to shut down the court. So I was interested in the mechanics of it. So can I just contextualize this in the context of some other work you've done on Latin America? Mm -hmm. And one of the lessons I took from your work on Latin America is that, uh, I think it was in the context of the Andean pact. Right. So we take a model that seems to work well in Europe and we say, wow, yeah. no preliminary references, this is the way to go, it empowers domestic courts, your earlier yeah. work, etc. You transplant it. <laughs> I think most of our readers would not even have heard about that story. They would not yeah. know there was a kind of replica of the uh, European community <laughs> system, etc., yeah. which, which points in the direction that uh, maybe in these regional organizations, courts are much less important, etc., so that the backlash, in a way, is a sign of vitality. They care about it. It makes a difference. Uh, they do. I mean, so the, we're, um, Larry and I are updating our research on the Andean Court, and we're just about to finish a book on it. Uh, and the Andean Court is, is another fascinating case. And I don't think I would call this backlash, although you can see I'm fumbling around the line of backlash. So the court is surprisingly effective in the sense that it can render decisions on very controversial issues. It's the automaticity in the rules mean that if you're a private litigant and you're upset about something, you actually can get the case to the court. And so they have a case right now, they have a couple cases against Ecuador. And um, Ecuador's political leader, Correa, uh, is doing policies that clearly violate Andean law. And he is in a huge um, crisis of dollars. He used the, Ecuador as a dollarized economy. And they're literally out of money. And every ec import that they bring in sends dollars out of the country. So they want to block imports that will cost them dollars. And the case is in front of the Andean court. And it might just kill the Andean community. Now, how would it kill the Andean community? In, in a different way, um, Correa has created this new union called UNASUR. And his idea is to, that UNISOR is going to be a merging of the Mercosur and the Andean community. And if you subsume the Andean community into UNISOR, which has on paper all of these lovely um, you know, UNISOR citizenship, Schengen inside of UNISOR, and it's all a complete fiction, that he will kill the Andean court that way. And so you have this strange irony going on right now in the Andean community. The number of rulings is higher than ever. So in what we call the island of effective international adjudication, input in intellectual property, there are more and more cases. And even outside of that island, so if you, if you do the kind of analysis that I typically do, how many cases get to the court, what actually happens, are they building law, are the decisions followed, the court looks like it's totally thriving but it's standing on a precipice because it is effective, because Ecuador is going to lose these cases. It's on a precipice of getting completely subsumed. It will be an indirect assault. It'll be an assault on the entire Andean community because it's the whole structure of the system that is constraining Ecuador. And it'll be watering it down by putting it in a larger structure, which is also what's going on with international criminal law in Africa, right? This idea that you would create African courts with a criminal law competence and therefore take away the ICC's jurisdiction in these cases. So it is the way that the politics play out. At what point I call that backlash, and at what point I call it something else, I'm, I'm not there yet. But I'm, I'm interested in this phenomenon of how you sublimate an inconvenient authority of an international court. Because domestically, you just take over the judicial system. Uh, a last question. Yeah. Does the work have uh, sort of a law reform dimension, sort of a code of good practice in design? I mean, there's more and more the, the shift is away from the global right. to regional organization. Uh, by my count, if I exclude the investment area, 400 right. various forms of regional organization. Is there sort of a design 
element, okay, if you're going to have a code, this is the way you should do it to avoid some of the pitfalls? Well, so the argument that we ultimately come up with about how did the ECOWAS court survive, how did the East African backlash get diverted, and how did the SADC um, court get killed has to do with the following of the rules of procedure for allowing civil society to participate and the secretariat using its independence to basically leak information to civil society groups to mobilize the actors who would protect the court. The formal rules are the same in all three institutions. So when you say the design, can you design it differently? It's more whether you really live the rules. Um, what I've been learning by studying legal politics in a developing country context is they are masters at subverting the rules, at, at pretending that they're following the rules, so of performing adherence to the rules while they simultaneously completely subvert the rules. And so I don't know if there's an institutional design Here's a counterfactual. If SADC had specified that judges should stay in office until they're replaced, could Mugabe have gotten away with what he had done? Would he have just found another way to kill the court? But Mugabe got away with what he had done also because of sort of at least a tacit complicity of the other partners. Well, I don't know if I, I agree with that. So there were many. Mugabe kept proposing changing the court's mandate, and he would have needed unanimity to do this. This is why the backlash took three and a half years. And he never could get that unanimity. It wasn't until the court was completely dead that in order to resurrect it, you would need unanimity, and then he could force through his terms. So it was the killing the court in practice that allowed him to ultimately win. Otherwise, they could just stonewall. Him. I mean, Mugabe lives forever. I mean, the guy's what in his 90s. They, they might have thought he would go away. And since the case that he was upset about was a signature case for land reforms, he was just not going to let this go. That was not his personality. But in, you could imagine an alternative scenario where the next person would come in and just say, you know, water under the bridge, reconstitute the court as it is, stack the judges. You know, they had, the, they had an alternative route, which was to stack the judges. They had all retired and just let the political notice you know, be there. But Mugabe was intent on stripping private access to this court. So it was his level of commitment to it. Because he was intent, because he's a master at working around the formal rules, um, yes, the other countries had to go along. I think that they were afraid to go out publicly to challenge Mugabe. He's very politically popular on the street. And while his land reform, ask any lawyer, clearly violates all rule of law principles, it's popular because he actually did reform. He did take land away from the white landowners and gave it to many people. It's a less racist, um, racially discriminatory land reform than it was when the court ruled. Um, it now has taken uh, land from black farm owners as well, and it has now redistributed it to a broader range of actors, not just as cronies. And so it's a very popular policy. So the political leaders did not want to be siding with this international court that Mugabe would publicly say is financed by Europeans. It's all this foreign courts, and they're blocking our ability to, to change land reform, which they're right about. Um, and so that's why the political leaders kind of went along. They didn't want to publicly be against him. Well, I hope uh, our conversation will uh, lead a l many people to read uh, the piece. Mm -hmm. And we might uh, expect uh, quite a vibrant debate on, not on EGIL Live, on EGIL Talk. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Karen. Thank you.